All right, so Baz Luhrmann's Elvis came out this year in June. So now five months later, I'm going to talk about it. Given my history talking about biopics, music biopics in particular, many of you wanted to know what I thought of this film. So let's do it. Let's talk about the biggest music biopic of this past year, Baz Luhrmann's balls to the wall movie about Elvis Presley. And this isn't going to be like a super in-depth video talking about the history of Elvis and biopics because fellow YouTuber Broey Deschanel has already made that video and it's terrific. I will link it up here. You should absolutely watch it. This video is more my thoughts on how the whole film comes together. The things that are working for it, the things that really aren't working for it, and whether it answers the question of does this film do anything interesting with the biopic genre? A genre that I and many people have pointed out has become a stale and formulaic staple of Oscar bait that never seems to learn from the lessons made by previous mediocre biographical pictures. Speaking of prior biopics, Elvis has been played before by various actors, usually in TV movies or miniseries. Two of the most well-known depictions would be Kurt Russell's impressive and understated performance in 1979, as well as Jonathan Reese Meyer's less convincing but still notable attempt in 2005. And who can forget perhaps the best depiction of Elvis, Jack White in Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. Come on, man, look on, sit in on that now. Turn around, sit around, look out, man. Look at this, I'm a long game, sir, man. Well, thanks, Elvis. <laughs> well, I'm on, I'm on. Come on. But Baz Luhrmann's film is the first proper biopic of the man to get a worldwide release in movie theaters. Right off the bat, this film is bonkers. <laughs> I mean, it's a Baz Luhrmann movie, and if you've ever seen one of those before, you'll be familiar with the frantic and bedazzling style he brings to his projects. I mean, check out this clip from the opening montage where the spaceship from Star Trek The Experience turns into a roulette wheel, which is cast into a fiery red eye before it propels the wheel back into the Vegas Strip. This is the entire energy of Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, and I think it's honestly one of the things this film has going for it. This movie is presenting to us the story of Elvis Presley, a man who gave new meaning to the term larger than life. His journey as a performer was tumultuous, bombastic, and incredibly surreal, given that he was the first musician to reach this extreme level of fame and stardom. The movie feels more like Elvis the ride than Elvis the man. The kinetic and frenzied manner in which this film is edited and presented seems like Baz was trying to put you in the driver's seat of the explosive highs and lows of Elvis Presley's insane and tragic career, and I think he mostly pulls it off. Mainly because, again, Lerman's style of filmmaking lends itself to someone like Elvis. You know, over the top, name in lights, not necessarily a whole lot of depth, like you wouldn't want him making a film about... Bob Dylan or Simon and Garfunkel, but he gets the spectacle of Elvis right. And I personally would like to see more compatible pairings like this of director and subject in future. However, I think if I was making a film about Elvis Presley, I think I would want to create something less broad strokes and more specific because this film is very much the Elvis that we all know. It's not in any way a look into his private life or for example, the many ways that the success of Elvis came at a price of the careers of other black artists from around the same time. It's definitely not a film about the grooming of 14 year old Priscilla when Elvis himself was 24. It certainly mentions these troubling elements, but by no means plunges into the ramifications of these decisions. I do think these issues deserve more exploration in future films, but this was never going to be that, especially with Presley's estate involved in the way it was. The movie is actually told from the perspective of Elvis's longtime manager, Colonel Tom Parker, a Dutch carnival worker who emigrated illegally to the States and pretended to be American as he moved into the business of music promotion, which is how he came upon Elvis and managed him from his early days playing music halls in the South to his torturous Las Vegas residency in the final years of his life. Tom Parker's dream was to create the greatest show on earth, and he believed that Elvis was the act that that could make that happen. This storytelling device makes the whole film feel like a strange carnival amusement attraction or a drunken Vegas show at two in the morning. And like Elvis's career, the film starts out really fun and exciting, 
But as it goes on, we start to see just how sad and unfortunate Elvis's life ended up becoming. He spent his last few years taking an almost constant stream of drugs and consuming a diet of foods that were high in fat and cholesterol like fried peanut butter sandwiches and bacon wrapped meatballs. Now look, eating well is often not an easy thing to navigate, what with so many options out there, but with today's sponsor, HelloFresh, you can make sure that you're not only eating, but cooking amazing, healthy meals for a great price. Let's face it, trying to decide what to eat for dinner every night requires almost as much effort as cooking the actual meal, especially with myself and my partner. We're vegetarian, but we sometimes eat fish. She doesn't like creamy foods. I'm not a fan of pumpkin. It gets kind of tricky. But what if I told you that there was a way to make choosing meals fun with lots of options to fit your dietary requirements that are also nutritious and super tasty as well. This is what HelloFresh offers. And each recipe features pre-portioned ingredients delivered right to your door. So you're not stuck trying to figure out how much ginger you need at the grocery store. In fact, you can just skip the grocery store altogether. This puts the emphasis back into enjoying cooking and learning which ingredients pair well together. Like I said, I eat a mainly vegetarian diet and I've loved the Sri Lankan roast eggplant curry with garlicky peanut rice. It was super delicious. <laughs> As were the crumbed plant-based burger with fries. I'll absolutely be making that again. Oh, and the zucchini carrot and cheddar fritters with roast veggie salad and baba ganoush, just exceptional. I'm also a pretty slow cook, again, cause I'm usually taking too long converting milliliters to grams or something. But with easy to follow recipes, I found that I was blazing through these with next to no effort. Quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. And right now using my promo code, you can get a fantastic deal. Go to hellofresh.com and use code ELLIOTR18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. I honestly was so impressed with the quality of these meals and I know you will be too. So once again, go to hellofresh.com, use code ELLIOTR18 for 18 free meals plus free shipping. Thank you HelloFresh for sponsoring and now back to Elvis. So now you've got the background of the film, let's discuss what I believe to be the things that made this movie work. First, we got the man himself, Austin Butler as Elvis Presley. I'll just say it, this dude gave an incredible performance. And I'm not just saying that because we had the same acting teacher, shout out to Howard Fine. I'd actually only seen him in one movie before, briefly in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, so I really didn't have any expectations. From the photos and the trailer, I thought he had the looks down, but that doesn't get you anywhere if you can't act. The thing that actually got me on board was the second he opened his mouth to speak in the film, where he says, What if I forget the words on live radio? What if I forget the words on live radio? It was such a brief line, but contained so much vulnerability and tenderness and just sounded like the real Elvis Presley. And it's not just the accent, it's the cadence, the rhythm, the tonality, it's all just pitch perfect. From there, I thought he just carried this film from start to finish, both in the early songs that he sung by himself, which really blew my mind. That's all right, mama. That's all right with you. But also the way he straddled those later era songs where they blended his voice with the real Elvis. I, I, just, I just couldn't believe he had those kind of vocal chops. He even gradually shifts his voice throughout the film from young to older Elvis in a subtle way, but one that really grabbed my attention. I'm just trying to take care of you and daddy. That's all I've ever cared about. I, I, I'd like to turn the house lights up. This the International Hotel himself. It's just rare in these kind of films. Like when you compare it to the only other music biopic that has beaten Elvis at the box office, Bohemian Rhapsody, where you've got Rami Malek's speaking voice painfully transitioning into the real Freddie Mercury voice. Don't be so dramatic, darling. Oh, You're recording an album wise. tonight. Let's go. Don't you think I sound like shit? There, it just takes you out of the experience, but in Elvis, it's seamless. Uh, bring that bass up, Jerry. Help me. Help me. Let's go. Let's go. Along with Jamie Foxx's Ray Charles, in my opinion, Austin Butler embodies Elvis Presley better than any actor who's ever had to play a real life musician. Even Elvis's daughter and widow were completely taken by his performance. It's almost as if he channeled him. He, he puts everything he had, his heart, soul. He honored him in every way possible. He got Elvis to a T. I mean, to a T. It, it, it's unbelievable what this kid did, Austin. This is even some of the songs. I said, is that Elvis or is that Austin? And he wow. goes, no, that's Elvis. And then I go, you sure? And then about a minute later, he goes, 
that's Austin. Oh my God. <laughs> I do kind of wish he had a more substantial script and a less cartoony scene partner, which I'll get into in a bit. Because even though this was nearly a three hour film, I was kind of left wanting to see what else Austin Butler was capable of in this role. I suppose I did kind of get my wish because to my knowledge, the dude hasn't stopped playing Elvis since the film wrapped. You may have seen this by now, but the fact that Austin Butler went from sounding like this before shooting Elvis. I always was uh, quite a loner as a child. I would just stay inside and play the guitar for eight hours a day. I, uh, my parents would try to get me, they would punish me by taking away the guitar and making me go play with other children. To this, after rapping Elvis. My parents used to ground me by taking away my guitar because I, I would just sit in my room and play for eight hours a day until my fingers bled. It's just so weird and funny to me. Like I know they had to pause production for a year and a half because of the beginning of COVID, where I guess Butler just stayed in character for the entire time and now it genuinely seems like this is just who he is now. To my mind, I've not heard of this happening where an actor's whole accent changes based on a role they played. Can someone in the comments let me know if this has ever been a thing? In terms of what else worked, I thought the film started really well. The first 40 minutes in particular contain some of the best scenes of the entire film. There's the one where Elvis is a kid and he hears gospel music for the first time coming from this tent where there's a preacher giving a sermon and Elvis has his come to Jesus moment with this music that's going to be his salvation, his superpower. It's almost like a drug that he's coming up on, the way it consumes him. I thought it was really cool. My favorite scene in the whole film, and one of my favorites in any music biopic, is where Elvis is playing to a crowd for the first time. He's nervous and they're not on his side, jeering at him and telling him to get a haircut. But then he busts into Baby Let's Play House. It starts wiggling his hips and shaking his legs and these sheltered Christian girls and women in the crowd start involuntarily screaming with pleasure. I love this depiction of Elvis as this forbidden fruit and these women just overcome by his charisma and sex appeal. Another nod to Austin Butler for getting the physicality of Elvis so spot on. What are that? The wiggle. But what? Them girls won't see you wiggle. Move, man. Elvis represents this kind of danger and excitement that these women have been denied their whole lives. And as they experience these feelings, they're not sure whether they're meant to actually be enjoying them or not. And it finally comes out in this display of wild euphoria. I'm glad they made such a moment of this because teenage girls have always been the first to give these pop stars the momentum that catapults them to worldwide fame. From the Beatles to BTS, girls screaming in the crowd are how you've always known whether those boys on stage are going to be worth their salt. I mean, look at this shot here. It's like a Baroque painting, which is befitting as those girls were having a religious experience. So for me, I thought this entire sequence was absolutely captivating. Plus, I think it's always a strong decision to show how the music icon in any given biopic is viewed by the general public, which is a consistent occurrence in Elvis and it's all the better for it too. In general, the scenes where Elvis is performing live are some of the best in the whole film. Usually with music biopics, the live reenactments always seem kind of hokey with barely any of the electricity of the real life performers. But in Elvis, whether it's his 1968 comeback special or his slew of shows during his Vegas residency, Every single one of them is dynamic and shows how Elvis evolved as a performer and artist. It's also where Baz Luhrmann's direction is most befitting. They even included that clip of him deep throating the mic. Straight razor told woman. Lord have mercy. Also, quickly, just shout out to Alton Mason as Little Richard. Who absolutely steals the show for a brief minute of the film. Just like how Elvis stole Tutti Fruity from Little Richard. He didn't steal it, I know, but he did appropriate the fuck out of it. One of the ways this Elvis film strikes an original tone is how it incorporates the mood of each time period into account. For example, the point in the 1960s where Elvis was making all those goofy ass family friendly films, Baz Luhrmann depicts this period of his life like one big Hollywood movie, which I found to be a fun way to keep this story chugging along, especially when contrast with the political upheaval that was occurring at the same time. I thought it an effective way of showing why Elvis was starting to seem irrelevant and trivial and why he needed that 68 comeback special to remind people of his significance. There's other moments here and there that I enjoyed, like Elvis creating his new Vegas show. I liked the way he worked with the band to build the sound he wanted to infuse his new act with. <laughs> it's 
it's one of the few displays of genuine creativity by Elvis in the film, considering he wasn't a songwriter, so I appreciated that. But otherwise, that's mostly what I thought were the best parts of Baz Luhrmann's Elvis. Now for what I think didn't work. <laughs> I started with Austin Butler in the last section, and now I'm kicking this one off with Tom Hanks. <laughs> Dude, what? What are you doing? Look, no one's more disappointed than me here. I love Tom Hanks. He's been the star of some of my all-time favorite films, but here he's just... We are two odd, lonely children. You know how when you're goofing around with your friends and one of them tries to do an impression or a weird voice and it's so bad and uncomfortable and you just want them to stop, but they won't because it's funny for them how much you're not enjoying it? That's what watching Tom Hanks and Elvis is like. It was Elvis the showman and the colonel the snowman. The whole time, this weird cartoonish voice of his just never settles. And I get that the real Colonel Tom Parker had a bit of an odd accent, but even in this clip of him talking, there's still more light and shade than what Tom Hanks manages to muster up. I've never heard of anything like this, but uh, I'm very happy with it. And I know if Al was, is anyway looking down, I think he's laughing pretty good with what's going on. And I'm Dutch on my mum's side, so I know a Dutch accent when I hear one, and this was closer to gold member from Austin Powers than someone from the Netherlands. I love gold! Tom Hanks is also just wearing a mountain of prosthetics on his face and body. I don't know what's going on in Hollywood today. I mean, do they just not hire fat actors anymore? I know there's actors who look enough like this role that could have played this easily, most likely better than Tom Hanks. I guess I'm just not really on the fat suit train that's been doing the rounds the last few years. Boof. I think it will just be one of those odd moments in movie history where we go, why did we do that? <laughs> it just doesn't help this very cartoonish and oddball character that Tom Hanks is playing. And it's so unfortunate because the person that he acts opposite the most is Austin Butler, and it's like they're in two completely different movies. The edits between the two actors are also so choppy and quick, almost like they filmed Hanks and Butler's shots at different times, which given the COVID of it all may well have happened. And the fact that Tom Parker is the narrator of the film means that we see and hear from him a whole lot. And from the second we meet this man, we learn that there's one thing that he loves above all else, Christmas. I am the legendary Colonel Tom Parker. Seriously, what feels like a whole third of this film, the Colonel's one mission is to get Elvis in a Christmas sweater and sing Here Comes Santa Claus on live TV. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus. But we are going to start with Here Comes Santa Claus. He sings. Here comes Santa Claus. It's time for Here Comes Santa Claus. I said so too. Here comes Santa Claus. Santa He's just such an unlikable, awful presence in Elvis's life, which I think is the point. He is the villain of the story. And for better or worse, it makes the last third of this film a pretty deflating viewing experience as Elvis remains trapped in his Vegas residency, consistently being denied a tour overseas by Colonel Tom Parker. It also got kind of hilarious how much the film reminds you of this by repeatedly throwing in the, we're caught in a trap. I can't walk out from Suspicious Minds. The best Elvis can get is touring the States whilst being fed drugs by his doctor. It's kind of depressing to watch Elvis remain trapped as he spirals into his addictions, with the film dragging on as we slowly discover that Parker can't let Elvis overseas because he himself has no visa. I'm not saying this didn't work. In fact, it made me realize how much potential Elvis had left untapped as an actor and singer that maybe if he had other people caring about his well-being, he may have had an even more decorated career had it not been for this schmuck. It made me wonder where else Elvis may have gone musically, what kind of sounds and genres he could have experimented with. Speaking of experimenting with different musical sounds, what was with the soundtrack of this film? Baz Luhrmann is no stranger to incorporating modern music into his period pieces. In fact, updating old stories for a modern audience is kind of his thing. But unlike in, say, The Great Gatsby, where the modern music was a welcome and cohesive inclusion, I mean, it's set in the 20s, you don't exactly want to listen to two hours of flapper music. But in Elvis, there's already so much music that was driving the film, but then out of nowhere, you'll hear this jarring snippet of contemporary auto-tuned R&B. And it makes for such a strange addition to the film. During an early scene set on Beale Street, we hear an excellent rendition of Hound Dog from the late Shonka de Cure playing Big Mama Thornton. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. But then 
this Doja Cat song comes in creating an incongruous union of the two tracks that alone might make for an interesting mashup to show how R&B has evolved into the hip hop music of today. But as for soundtracking a period film like this, it just doesn't fit for me. It's forcing two pieces together that alone carry their own merit, but combined just make the other sound trivial in comparison. Another example is this Denzel Curry song, Let It All Hang Out. Which is followed by the aforementioned Little Richard scene where he sings Tutti Frutti, which is an all time great rock and roll number that absolutely stands up on its own without the need to have a super bassy rap song right before it. The most absurd example is where Elvis's song Rubber Neckin is playing over a montage before a very recognizable sample of the Backstreet Boys is thrusted in on top. But Elvis was a young man, and of course. And it honestly sounds like it was added in by mistake. Like they, when they were sequencing the album, it just kind of slipped in at random. And I think I get what Baz Luhrmann was going for. There are times where this technique does actually work. For example, when Elvis is plucking out the courage to get on stage for the first time. <laughs> thumping bass and sped up tempo of That's All Right Mama really pumps the audience up as Elvis channels that spiritual connection of when he first heard this music as a child. Or the blistering electric guitar solos that are added in into his aforementioned debut performance. <laughs> emphasize the danger and ferociousness of Elvis's swagger and influence. But for the most part, combining these old and new tracks doesn't really blend these different periods of R&B and instead feels like it's just one era of music being smushed on top of the other. Although I mentioned the fresh ways this film's unique, if manic editing gives it a certain originality and style, it is still mostly a linear biopic that covers 20 years of a man's life in a two and a half hour film. So naturally, to fit in as many elements of Elvis's career, we do experience our fair share of music biopic tropes. The montage of him traveling across country, playing to different states, the service level writing of his wife Priscilla, who slowly falls out of love with Elvis due to the rock star's drug taking and infidelities. Basically all those tropes that Walk Hard covered 15 years ago. I chuckled to myself a few times because of how many similarities there are between Walk Hard and Elvis. You've got Elvis's mom praying to Elvis's twin brother Jesse who died in the womb, bringing to mind Dewey's brother Nate who died when they were kids. Jesse's shining bright tonight. We're gonna light us a candle tonight. Or when Elvis buys his parents a big house with lots of animals, or the knavish way Elvis is offered pills to stay awake on tour, beginning a lifelong habit of drug abuse. The bad guy would hold the joint in like a villainous way. They'd always offer the joint in a way that no one ever holds a joint. Like it's a skull in a Shakespeare play. Yeah, I guess a lot of this really comes down to the script, which without the flashy editing choices and Austin Butler holding this film together, really isn't anything special. It doesn't drill down into anything of substance. Like I would have loved to see how Elvis coped with two years of military service, but instead we more or less skip right past it to Elvis getting into a relationship with Priscilla. And by the way, Casey Musgraves rendition of Can't Help Falling In Love With You playing over Elvis's blossoming relationship with a child. Would it be a sin? Would it be a sin? Yes. Yes, it would be. There was just a more nuanced way to go about this. There are also some god awful accents of the American South from a few of the Australian cast. We've been poking into your background and we found your records. And I know many of them were cast last minute due to COVID related scheduling issues, but too many times I was taken out of Memphis and put right back into North Queensland. But with the good and bad of this film, how does it all come together as a whole? And does it actually push the music biopic genre in an exciting new direction? For me, I think the film that bears the most similarities to Elvis is 2019's Rocket Man about Elton John. They're both films that tell a mostly linear story about one man's life. Rocket Man is played out like a jukebox musical of Elton John's many songs, which I thought was fun and engaging. Elvis features slick editing and a big and bold style that morphs into different states as Elvis's career goes through its many high highs and low lows. In both films, there's plenty of music biopic tropes, but luckily there's enough going on with Elvis that those elements don't overshadow the other the parts that are working. And the parts that work, work really well, particularly Austin Butler's portrayal. I've made the case before that for a biopic to work, 
An actor doesn't necessarily have to look or sound exactly like the person they're playing, but it's fortunate that in this case, Butler happens to fulfill that requirement and then some. This is clearly someone who has meticulously studied this man inside and out. And for the recreations of famous performances, We're lost in a cloud. We're too much. he becomes an almost mirror image of Elvis. Austin Butler's performance alone is enough of a reason to watch this film in my point of view. I would have loved this film to take a few more risks when covering issues like Elvis reaping the benefits off the backs of songs written and performed by black men. It kind of leaves the morality of it up to the audience, which again, I understand, but it just would have given this film a bit more depth. Like to have Elvis saying that he'd love to perform Tutti Frutti with the express purpose of making more money than Little Richard. And then the next scene he's talking, singing and drinking with other black musicians makes it seem like it's all fine. Elvis is one of the good guys, but of course we know it wasn't as simple as that. But overall, this is a worthwhile music biopic about one of the biggest figures in rock and roll history. I think Baz Luhrmann was the right man for the job and his style of filmmaking was a match made in heaven for the wild and thrilling story of Elvis Presley. In terms of if it'll win any Academy Awards, I think Austin Butler will get a nomination for acting, but he won't win. Maybe a few more nods for costume and makeup, but that's it. But what did you think of the film? I would love to read your thoughts down in the comments and let me know where it ranks in your choice of music biopics. And just a reminder that I've recently restructured my Patreon. So for example, my monthly bonus video is now a few dollars cheaper. So if you'd like to check out some extra content exclusive to Patreon, as well as supporting me like these legends do, the link to join plus the link to get 18 free meals plus free shipping with HelloFresh is in the description. All right, thanks everyone. Hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you did, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you.